20 years old, uh, a young Marine. And I was signed to the United States Embassy in Tehran, Iran. I had never heard of that country. I hear thousands of people coming down to the embassy. And they started climbing over the gates. For two weeks, I had to sleep with my hands in plastic handcuffs. And I was scared to death. The administration is now emphasizing diplomacy as the way to get the Americans released. Iran must be the only country in the world with a television program on how to tackle American commandos in the street. There was growing desperation. I was very determined to get the hostages released. We were getting ready to run for re-election. Isn't it about time that this country decides we're going to be respected? You can't look weak here. The mission was very plain and simple. Bring home 52 American hostages. The Delta Force group had been created in 1975. Only certain people get picked to fly with the special ops. He said, I'll see you when I see you. I knew that he was going to Iran. We would fly into a remote desert location. Intel said, the road you landed by has never traveled. All of a sudden, his life. I turn around, coming towards us is a bus. There was never a full up dress rehearsal. All of a sudden, I see this rolling fog bank. Our flight instruments were starting to fail. It's pretty, pretty disturbing. My friend said, turn on your TV. Something has happened. The whole nature of the rescue involved risk. I never saw the president so shocked and stunned. Carter said, if we are successful, it will be your achievement. If we are not successful, it will be my defeat. Thanks for the introduction. Today's Soft Stories Live is honored to welcome a legend in the special operations community, Command Chief Master Sergeant Richard Taco Sanchez, U.S. Air Force, retired. Hello, Chief. Welcome to Soft Stories Live, and thanks for sharing your story with us. Hello, Rick. How are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. It, it just seems like ancient history. I mean, it's, it's hard to believe that Operation Eagle Claw was launched over 40 years ago. I was like a 20-year-old Ranger Corporal assigned to uh, 1st Ranger Battalion in Savannah, Georgia, when the company received the warning in order to begin planning for the hostage rescue. And, and again, that, that mission, uh, and, and also playing well with others, you know, that we, we, we do to come, uh, we, we soon understood was working jointly. Uh, that was all brand new to us. So, uh, so from me to you, I apologize up front. I was one of those Rangers who would uh, show up at the bottom of your ramp and ask you to overload your aircraft and then make it fly. So, uh, so how about you? How about you, uh, Chief? What, uh, what was your rank position and assignment when you uh, learned you were going to Iran? I was a staff sergeant uh, loadmaster in the 8th SOS uh, when we got the uh, call in November. And uh, it was uh, very interesting because it was all new to us, too, what uh, we were going to attempt. Yeah, but it was uh, it was just crazy. I mean, the we, we just saw the intro. That was a, that was a heck of a movie, by the way. The uh, it was, and the strategic implications of Eagle Claw and its aftermath. You know, that's been analyzed for for forty years. I mean, there's a lot of information out there online, and, and I would urge the audience to uh, to seek it out because history often repeats itself, especially for those that that fail to learn from it. So, uh, you know, in, in the special ops community, Eagle Claw is considered a pivotal moment in uh, special operations history. And it's credited with establishing uh, what we would consider the, you know, the modern day joint special operations force. I mean, it changed, uh, it changed everything. It established commands, units, relationships, mission sets, joint tactics, techniques, procedures that, uh, that still survive to this day. And it also prepared a small cadre of leaders like yourself uh, to meet the future threats that the nation would face for, for the next four decades. So Chief, having said that today, I'd like to focus on the, lo the lower echelons. You kind of what uh, what you and the other non-commissioned officers and enlisted men were thinking when you received the mission and what you had to accomplish in order to make it happen. And I mean, for, for those that are listening to the podcast without uh, any military experience, 
You got commissioned officers. Those are your lieutenants, your captains, your majors, your, your colonels and generals. They think the big thoughts. They develop the plans. They, they provide direction. But they always turn to an enlisted man or woman and a non-commissioned officer, the privates, the corporals, the sergeants, and the chiefs, and they say, get it done. Get after it. And that's when the real sweating starts. So, uh, so I want the audience to keep in mind that the U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command did not even exist in 1979. And a mission like Eagle Claw had not been attempted since the Sante raid to rescue U.S. prisoners of war deep inside North Vietnam over a decade earlier. And we were able to accomplish that mission uh, using mature formations, well-trained forces, well-established command and control, and a robust logistics system that was already in place in Southeast Asia. But by 1980, only a decade later, we had lost that capability like we always tend to do, and uh, the force had atrophied. So, Chief, what were you thinking when your boss gave you that mission? And what were some of the major problems, and, and, and how did you solve them? Well, you know, the, the thing that most people uh, don't know or, or understand is in uh, the late 70s, at post-Vietnam, you know, uh, the U.S. government was downsized in soft forces. They were getting rid of special forces battalions. They were getting rid of SEAL teams. Uh, most of our airplanes were scheduled either to go to the reserves or the boneyard because, you know, special ops uh, wasn't well liked uh, post-Vietnam because uh, we were called the Sneaky Peets or whatever you want to call it when it was all said and done. So when the word came down, they go, we don't know what we're going to want you to do, but go figure it out. You know, back then, you know, basically our mission was infill, exfill, a, a small uh, ODA team, and then resupply them. That was pretty much uh, the, the the soft mission at the time. Uh, there was not a whole lot of training or anything else. There was no such thing as NVGs. There was no such thing as the rapid infill, exfill. So we had to develop all of that, and we did it. Uh, we deployed, I think. Uh, Somewhere 9 or, or 10 November to Savannah, Georgia is where we linked up when you were a baby, too. And uh, it was interesting because, you know, all of a sudden you guys got gun jeeps and uh, motorcycles. And we're trying to go, how are we going to get them in and out of the airplane uh, as quickly as possible? And uh, when we first started, it was uh, my crew. And uh, that was it initially until a couple more. And we expanded the force. But we first started, we looked at weight and balance uh, in the airplanes and the Jeeps, we decided uh, the Jeep would be on the ramp and then the motorcycles is in the cargo compartment. The Jeep, uh, at its weight, we figured we put chains and devices on it to hold it down and then rapidly offload it. Well, there's nothing rapidly offloaded when you're using chains and devices. And oh, by the way, you're in the dark. Uh, with minimum lighting, uh, we wanted to go to no lighting, but we didn't. The back end didn't have MVGs in. We were neither did the front end particularly. So it was like okay. So first run in Savannah, the first uh, fly in with the Rangers. We open up just as we land, and we're opening up the ramping door, and we release the devices. Well. Some of them ended up outside the airplane and stuff. So it was an adventure. I'm surprised we didn't run over a, a, a chains and devices to uh, kill each other uh, uh, as that whole process was going. But zero of that capability existed then. So it was pretty much uh, at, at the nug level, which was uh, the, the line flyers, uh, same as it was in the Ranger battalions uh, and in the, uh, the, the Delta companies, was trying to figure out how are we going to execute? What are we going to execute? And each time uh, we'd go do uh, a fly to Savannah or whatever, there'd be something new we thought about. And so we, uh, we uh, kept doing uh, different types of iterations and we ended up with uh, over trial and error. And there was a lot of trial and error. And this is just the infill exfill piece of, oh, getting the range, of getting the Rangers in. And, uh, you know, we went through a lot of iterations and we finally ended up with one that worked very well, well and that was using straps and having the Rangers actually uh, utilize and, and operate the straps, which was very, very unique uh, that never been happened before. 
we created a comfortable situation in the airplane because if you, Rick, you've been in a C-130. Uh, when you got, mattresses. Web, you, you got those web seats and stuff, it's not fun ride when you're piling everybody in like cordwood. So we uh, we went over to Eglin Air Force Base and stole the, well, we appropriated the uh, mattresses from DRMO and we called it the Sealy One configuration. So we basically yeah. put uh, uh, twin mattresses all over the cargo floor and that's what the Rangers sat on infill and exfill, which was much more comfortable, much more easier. We could actually load more. They could put more data uh, uh, equipment where they needed to. It kind of worked out well. And we perfected it in a short period of time with uh, the Charlie you remember, company. You remember the long cargo strap going across to everybody? Oh, yeah. We had, we had a strap right? across we everybody. You know, as it evolved, we ended up using carabiners hooked to the floor. But that was a regular thought process that went out. But initially, that's where we were at. And, uh, you, you for the on, on the Rangers and the uh, you know Hard Rock Charlie, the uh, first battalion, they, they received the warning order for Eagle Claw, and, and our commander Captain Grange, you know he he himself was a Ranger in Vietnam, and he uh, he brought the company into the day room, and uh, he he started asking us questions like uh, who in the company drives off road vehicles, uh, who owns motorcycles, uh, who are the best snipers, who are the best machine gunners, uh, who had mechanical expertise or grew up on a farm and could keep equipment running. And uh, so, I mean, unbeknownst to us, you know, he's, he was leveraging these strengths that we didn't know that we had, and he was modifying our task organization for a mission set that we had never seen. And uh, during that whole process, I mean, much like you, I mean, he, he gave the non-commissioned officers and the enlisted guys an open in invitation to modify, uh, to invent. And, uh, and that, that made a big impression on me. The, uh, so, you know, like, like you say, what do you do... Uh, you know, strapping into the floor, those types of things. So, so if, if Eagle Claw was was the birth of the modern day Ranger, uh, a close DNA check would identify uh, Captain Grange as, as as the father of the modern day Ranger. But uh, how about you? I know, I know you you're one of the legends in the community. But uh, you know, we all worked for legend. What what leaders impressed you uh, during this whole train up, and and why? Well, Duke Wiley was the chief loadmaster in Stand of Alb, and he also was my flying mate in Desert uh, One. Uh, he didn't fly all the missions, but uh, we had some great uh, uh, experience post-Vietnam, Ray Doyle, Duke Wiley, uh, uh, Wesley B. Witherspoon, Kent Bancroft. Uh, there was just a lot that were all part of our small country. Remember, we only had uh, 14 combat talent ones in the whole United States Air Force. Wow. Six of them were Herbert. One was always in PDM. So you're not talking a big uh, crew. There's only 12 loadmasters assigned to Herbert. So you know, it's not a big force. The, the good part about it was is because we were so small, we could all operate at the same level. And when and because we were working strictly with the uh, 1st Battalion Charlie Company, it was the same Rangers we saw all the time. You know, there may have been a new one added here or there, but the bottom line is when we were doing the infill, exfill, rapid on and offload, we got to work together every day and, and, and uh, hone that skill that is, uh, to me, you can't get any better than what it was at that point in time. And everybody thought out of the box. It was one of those things, you know, you know what the rules say, you know, you don't want to kill yourself, uh, make it work. And that's kind of what we did. Well, that's true. Like I remember like in 79, you know, the uh, basic ranger hadn't changed a lot. I mean, we, uh, we walked everywhere. We carried everything on our back. And then uh, all of a sudden Eagle Claw, yeah, we were, uh, we're issued the, the old M M151 Jeeps. Uh, and then we had to learn how to drive and maintain them. Uh, some guys had licenses, but they're mostly going on you know, their uh, previous experience. And again, our, our experience with aircraft, I mean, that, that involved jumping out of them before they landed. That was it. And, and you guys had that down to an art. But uh, so we had to, like you said, we had to uh, create vehicle load plans. You know, what are we going to put on these things to keep their center of balance? Then aircraft load plans, how are we going to uh, put them on the plane? And then how we gonna? You had to practice driving. Remember that driving, driving them on and off, and you had to back them in. You know, drive them straight out. And then we task organized for this uh, just uh, you know multitude of missions, supporting missions like you know, clearing and marking runways uh, with beanbag lights, uh, engaging troop concentrations, cutting electricity and phone lines, operating heavy machinery. And then uh, you know the biggest thing for us too is that you know, we had no idea what a U.S. Air Force combat controller did. You know, and uh, we, we were amazed that he could keep all that stuff stacked and flying. And uh, so we had to in integrate those guys into our formations so that they could resume air operations once we took the airfield down because uh, there was follow-on missions. You remember that? 
And then we, we developed the time warnings, the equipment checks, the communications checks, accountability. That was the big thing. I mean, we were scared to death we'd leave somebody behind. You know, that, that, we, we actually used it one time. I remember uh, handheld golf tally clackers, you know, the clickers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. count people in, count oh, people out. Luminous tape, grease pencils. And, and, and you know, working closely with you guys too, because um, we 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 had no idea what we were doing, so we had to we had to develop that in, in concert with you. And uh, because you know, I remember you guys always telling us, "Hey, we, we you know this thing has to has to fly, right?" And uh, and then you're running over ground troops, crunchies, and, and all that, like you said, in the Gen One night vision. But uh, I I agree with you. I, I think we quickly became like the best in the world at what we did, and I was amazed really at how fast we were able to do it. Well, you know, uh, we, we did a lot of, of, of training uh, side by side, and, and I think that helped uh, uh, to uh, build the catalyst to where we're at today. You know, the end results is you look at the things that we did starting and in a short period of time, because we never knew when we were going to execute. So we were trying to get uh, skills honed as fast as you could. So we got to spend a lot of time together. Uh, knocking heads back and forth. And then, you know, when we finally got NVGs in the back, uh, it was an adventure in itself because they were old full-face PBS-5s. And then the Ranger driver on the Jeep had a set of PBS-5s. Nobody else did. So that was even much more of an adventure. Everybody's doing touchy-feely trying to cipher out when we went to black out. But a lot of people don't realize the criteria is that whole airplane, no matter what the load was in it, we had to land from the time the wheels touched down to that airplane was empty, closed up, and ready to take off in less than 60 seconds. Now, you try doing that with uh, Jeeps, motorcycles, and a bunch of Rangers running out. We learned uh, some lessons the hard way. If something happened because of uh, aviation, where we had to change runways from, let's say we were landing, the plan yeah. was uh, from uh, 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 north to south, and we turned around and landed south to north. If we didn't tell the Rangers, what ended up happening is when they run out of the back of the airplane, they'd go X number of feet or X number of yards and they'd turn left and go uh, attack their, their sights. Well, if we landed the opposite direction, the Rangers went in the other direction. And now it was buffoonery on all the time because we're like, we're, they didn't know where they were at. Well, you're talking about pitch black out there. Well, that's true because we, we would use uh, engineer tape. So we would make a little airplane out of engineer tape and, and all the rangers would get in there. And then it was just a tape drill, the, all the objectives. And uh, so you're absolutely right. It was rope memorization. I go down a ramp, I turn left, I go 100 meters, and bam, I'm hitting a building. You know, good point. And the funny part, along with that, it was, we were also doing other things. We were learning how to, we were trying to drop uh, blivets for the helicopters uh, out in Yuma, Arizona. And that became a disaster of, you know, uh, the, uh, Riggers from uh, Fort Bragg, God love them to death. Uh, but uh, Colonel Wild Bill Foley, uh, God love him, you know, Rangers, you know, he's, a, he, he's in charge of uh, all the rigging for the Army. And uh, he wanted to put the uh, blivet out, which is a 500 gallon fuel blivet, with a G11 static line deployed. And we told him, you know, G11 is a 100 foot diameter parachute. That's a big damn parachute. And we told him, you know, Two G12s with a 15 foot par parachute works out real well. Nope, there's army training, sir. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> so we did three, uh, a three ship out at Davis Smothin, uh, and uh, I was lead. Uh, Chester was two, and Doyle was three. And uh, we told them this was not going to be pretty. We loaded four blivets in the airplane and strapped them in from a container delivery system uh, method. But when that gate cut, they boomeranged out at warp drive. It was like a heavy equipment going out, of, being extracted out of the airplane. Wow, like a lapse. So, yeah. yeah, so what happened was each airplane, my airplane, it broke the uh, left anchor cable, and it went all shot all the way forward and wrapped around the EWO, uh, the radio operator, tied him up. He couldn't get out of his seat with this uh, three-quarter-inch uh, cable wrapped around him. The... Uh, Right anchor cable uh, got stretched to where it was hanging off of the floor. Chalk two, both uh, A-frames that hold the uh, static line in uh, in the back of the C-130 were broken off, and they were just dangling a beat nail out of the back of the airplane. And then chalk three had one uh, elongated and then one with the uh, thing broke. So we landed back at davis Mott then, and uh, General Vaught goes, you guys are not happy. No. <laughs> So we done told you. 
and he finally looks over fully. He goes, you better make them, uh, the Air Force guys happy because they're not happy right now. You try to kill all of them. So that became a, a, an issue because the whole part of the whole thing was we got to be able to refuel the helicopters in the desert. That's how we evolved from that to the uh, bladder system, which was an old Vietnam era ABAPS, so uh, aero bulk delivery fuel system that uh, we started rehearsing, which beats putting the airplanes on the ground, the multiple airplanes, which drove us to a six ship. Because initially, if we were going to airdrop them, you know, we didn't need that many airplanes. But with the being on the ground, we ended up with a six ship. So it wasn't long. We were rehearsing, expanding crew to crew to crew uh, to be able to do that. And then, you know, from that initial force with the Rangers in C Company, we expand out the whole 1st Battalion because of, of the airfield seizure. So there was a lot of moving parts and, and uh, keeping everybody. But we rehearsed so many times that piece of the mission. We flew all the time. Matter of fact, every crew member that was part of the initial cadre, we averaged right around 1,100 flying hours in six months. That's a lot of time in the air. And, and you know, and that's what I remember as a, as a young kid too, with the especially you guys. I mean, working with the uh, the fixed wing, uh, you because know, in the Rangers we, we worked through reverse works uh, cycles. You know, we sharpened our skills in darkness. Uh, the first time that you know, we we increased the number of night vision goggles. Uh, we didn't have individual radios back in that day, so remember we went out, and we bought those uh, off the shelf, you know, big old bricks, the Motorola's. And uh, because we had to expand our ability to command and control. And uh, we, we also reached into some of the old Vietnam guys, the Sante Raiders, uh, the guys from Operation Blue Light, uh, because we had to become quickly proficient in uh, advanced marksmanship, putting rounds on target, you know, in, in close proximity to friendlies, and then uh, get skilled at uh, clearing buildings. So, uh, so we, we kind of reached into those, uh, that, that, uh, that Vietnam uh, lineage as well. And then, uh, but, but how, how did you guys like train the new airmen? And uh, did, did that change the way you led? I, I know it did with us. I mean, it, it changed everything for us. Well, as we expand crews, whoever uh, was senior, you know, uh, would take over the next crew and, and, and have a junior person with them. And then I would pick up another junior one for a while until we got the crew force the way we wanted it. And then, we'd add people as a third load master because we had to do that for the refueling birds. But initially, initial cadre, it was two of us that started it all. And then we went to four, two airplanes where we split up Duke and I, and then it, it, it expanded on, you know, and, and that's kind of how we did it. But you flew multiple missions and, you know, it was all said and done. It was all trial and error. I mean, you know, we modified airplanes. We cut holes in airplanes and stuff. They, they, they put lights on the outside of the airplane so we could IR lights so we could land at night. This was all new technology. Nobody had a clue. And, you know, uh, thank God that uh, we were given a uh, priority to get, do whatever we wanted. Now, maintenance hated us because we go out there and drill holes in the floor and they go like, you do what? Well, we need to do that. And it took 10 years to get all the airplanes uh, back in one configuration because there was so many. Each crew had an airplane they flew, huh. so it yep. was very, very uh, unique. That that is awesome. Now, now, uh, you, you remember Honey Badger? I mean, the uh, for, for those uh, up in uh, listening, that uh, everybody knows that you know there was Eagle Claw in, in Desert One, and uh, but few people know that uh, that after Eagle Claw, there was uh, there was a mission called Honey Badger. And uh, what impressed me about Honey Badger was the fact that it was seamless. I mean, we continued to plan and train undeterred for uh, for a rescue mission part two. And uh, so so that one went from like a small force um, doing a surgical raid to a larger force, uh, a lot more Rangers uh, with an airfield seizure on Tehran International Airport, followed by a thunder run through the city and assault on the embassy compound. And, uh, and again, what impressed me is that we were uh, – Kind of like you know what, what we did in Iraq, you know, years later. It, but we were willing to risk global condemnation and all-out war to rescue our people. And uh, the exfil I remember was a, was a rocket-assisted uh, C-130 that would take off from the soccer stadium. And uh, so, I, uh, if, for those of you that haven't read it, Colonel uh, Keith Nightingale, he's got a new book out called Phoenix Rising, and he believes that uh, had we not um, kept planning for Honey Badger and just accept the, the defeat of uh, Eagle Claw, that we would have lost the fight uh, to rest control, you know, later on of the each service soft element. 
and then ultimately establish uh, SOCOM for the uh, man, train, equip, and the funding piece. So, I, I, again, I think he's right. Uh, but also, I, th I think that, uh, you know, f as a nation, you know, evil triumphs when good men and women do nothing. So, uh, what do you remember? What, what are your memories of Honey Badger? And that, uh, what, what and who impressed you on that? Well, Honey Badger uh, was, I mean, it really, it, it was very, very seamless. After we uh, uh, mourned and buried our dead that we lost that night, uh, we rolled right back into mission planning and, and stuff. I got tapped to go multiple places to Pope Air Force Base, to Dias, to uh, uh, Charleston, where we were training up, uh, teaching tactics and techniques to C-130 SAW-2 low level uh, two out of Pope and Dias. And then uh, we also uh, picked up uh, 141s. We're training SAW low level two too. Which and, was, what's what's, uh, what's SAW-2 for those that don't know? Special Ops low level uh, is, is what SAW and they, called it two because they determined the normal saw would be one and two was more advanced, more uh, night vision, uh, blackout, uh, very uh, rapid infill, exfill instead of uh, more of a, of a train. So we had crews, uh, I think there was a uh, five, six crews at Pope, uh, five or six at uh, Dias. And we flew big, but back then we called them JRXs, joint readiness exercises. Uh, as a code name under a honey badger. And we, we were out West all over the place getting together. We did uh, multiple uh, iterations at Reese air force base in, uh, in Texas because it fit the uh, profile of uh, Duran international. And then we did uh, iterations out in uh, the Nevada desert because it fit uh, the uh, airport madri, which we could go to. At the same time, we had uh, people flying the credible sport airplane, trying to bring that up on speed. Uh, and, and, you know, as we evolved through it, there were incidences, there were accidents uh, that, that happened uh, and we lost some, but, you know, when you're training that hard, working that hard, it, it, it's pretty off the chain. And, you know, you look at uh, guys that uh, came out of desert one in Delta, Peter Schumacher, uh, Will Boykins, uh, Je, uh, uh, Bucky Burris, uh, 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 Mel Wick, you know, they were expanding uh, that uh, piece uh, uh, on their side uh, from a leadership, uh, you know, my best uh, uh, buddy, uh, General uh, uh, Dave Grange was 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 really spearheading and, and uh, Nightingale both on the Ranger side, bringing that up. Uh, and it, it just, you know, it was happening so fast that you, you, uh, you couldn't see yourself uh, coming or going, but when it was all said and done, we created a pretty rapid force capable of doing anywhere, any place, any time. And the only dilemma that we had was the same that we had in the desert was uh, joint interoperability because of the services and stuff. Uh, you know, my army, my air force, my Navy, my Marines, but in this world, uh, y'all got to work for one boss and everybody's got to be speaking the same language, but service, uh, rivalries, you know, uh, did not, uh, wasn't very compatible back then. Uh, and I think that was a catalyst that got it to where it's at today. You know, I, I think you're right. And that, uh, actually that's, that's an awesome segue. The, uh, you know, we, cause we, we've had this conversation before. I mean, the, the U S has a, has a horrible, horribly bad habit of failing to see the threats that lie over the horizon. And I mean, and if you look at our history, it's replete with it. I mean, World War I leads to World War II, which leads to the Cold War, which leads to the global war on terror. And then, and then we, we have this warrior caste now that uh, there's like 1% of the, uh, the, the, the kids in the United States will serve. And of that 1%, about 86% of them come from the same military families. So it seems like the warrior caste takes a face shot every time we transition. Now, the good thing is that we, we innovate pretty rapidly. Uh, we adapt very quickly, but we fail to adopt change. We adopt change very, very slowly. And uh, I mean, even from the Holloway Commission, you know, post Desert One, you know, it took us six years before uh, the Nunn Cohen Amendment had to legislate, um, you know, man training and equip, service like responsibilities, and funding, uh, i.e., SOCOM, to, uh, to, to kind of get this thing right. So arguably we're kind of in transition mode again. I mean, we find ourselves in that same spot. You know, we're, we're, 
my humble opinion, we're overly reliant on technology. Uh, we face budget cuts. I mean, wait, wait till the COVID bill comes due. Uh, we've got the service rivalries going on still. Um, and now we're in this shift in focus from counterterrorism to great power competition. And, uh, and I, I think that we have a fundamental misunderstanding of what that means and, and what threats that presents over the horizon. I mean, so you, you, you think we're in, uh, Chief, do you think we're in kind of danger of losing the bubble again? Oh, absolutely. You know, the, 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 the key in all of it that uh, maintains uh, constant through World War I all the way to today is in the uh, big picture, uh, civilian uh, legislature and everybody else, they think that we, the military, are a light switch. Flip the switch and we're on, flip the switch and we're off. They have no real concept of what it takes to hone the skills and keep the proficiency at the level you need it to be to save lives without losing lives. And, you know, it's like I get good conversations with people says, eh, uh, there's nothing special about you special operators. I said, you're absolutely right. There's not. The difference in us and anybody else is we will go anywhere, any place, anytime, do any job. We don't say no. We just say, send me. Watch your head. Yeah. So, so the end result is every one we lose, it takes five to six years to replace them at the same competency level. See, everybody thinks, okay, you go down to uh, uh, training and stuff, basic training. You come out, you're, now you're at a, a ranger uh, company. They don't understand what green platoon is. They don't understand what uh, training squadrons are, where you uh, start somewhere before you get to be an operator. It takes a while. You just don't pick, eh, okay, here you are. And to me, that's where society keeps losing it over and over again. But if you look recently, the SEALs just did a successful rescue mission. So, you know, there are great operations that are happening because the skill level is still there. But as we move forward, transition out of Afghanistan and Iraq, I think we'll go back into, uh, if we don't maintain the same training level, JRTs and stuff, we will lose that bubble again. And it will be hard uh, to uh, recreate in a very short period of time. Yep. And, and I agree with your, your earlier um, your earlier comment that I, I can remember when I first came in, I mean, seventh group was on the, in, in Latin America, was on the chopping block. The you know, first group in, in Asia was gone. The, uh, the only uh, third group in Africa was gone. The only groups that we had remaining was, uh, was you know, the fifth group in, uh, in, in the Middle East and the 10th group uh, over in Europe. And that was it. And I mean, so, you know, as, as terrorism started to, uh, to, to blister and they, they realized that uh, great power competition, you know, i.e. the Cold War, that we would have to do all this stuff through surrogates, that uh, that's when they started pushing, you know, they, they re, uh, reconstituted the Rangers, reconstituted uh, you know, the special forces groups and uh, gave us the force that we have today. But, but I, you know, I, I'm afraid that there, there will be a call yet again to, uh, to start cutting back. The, uh, and I, I I guess um, yeah, we, we lost eight dead in Iran, and, and I know to you it's personal. You know, you uh, you, you were on the ground, and uh, how, how do you how do you honor the sacrifices of the guys that we lost in the Eagle Claw forty years later? Well, out of that night, uh, you know, it was an ugly night. Uh, we encountered things that we weren't uh, expecting to. Uh, you know, the bus, the, the, the truck, and it went crazy things. And then the uh, the issues with the helicopters and then the sand and stuff. And we ended up running the helicopter on 130 together. And out of that, uh, we lost eight, uh, five Air Force and three Marines. When we came out of there and went back to Oman, you know, one of the thought processes, we sitting around, you know, uh, I mean, literally in, in, uh, just a total shock and stuff. Uh, it kind of percolated around that, you know, we ought to, what can we do? We lost that. And uh, out of that birth, uh, what we call the uh, Special Operations Warrior Foundation, where we made a promise that we would take care of the children of those we lost. And uh, we've been doing that for 40 years now. We now have uh, 480 that are, I think it's 490 now, graduated about 900 
in the hopper. And every time we lose a special operator, no matter what service, whether it's in training uh, or combat or whatever, we pick up the family. And I'm going to tell you what it means to them when they know, you know, whether it's the husband or the wife that we lose, or whichever family members left is uh, we pick those kids up and we, but we do cradle to grave. Uh, we, we pick them up uh, and uh, provide them with tutors, everything else. It doesn't cost them whatever school they want to go to. If they get selected to, they go. So we do that this year. was a shame because it was a 40th anniversary. We had a big anniversary event, but COVID took that out. But, you know, from, uh, I support that 100%. My biggest uh, hardship all the time is people confuse it with the Wounded Warrior Foundation. Two different foundations started for two different reasons. Uh, the Special Ops Warrior Foundation has going on since eighty. Wounded Warrior didn't come around in 2002. So big, big, big difference. And, you know, we don't have uh, the, the sponsorship that they do. Most of ours is, is dogs out working their ass off trying to uh, find stuff and do stuff. But matter of fact, one of the only events, live events this year, uh, the golf tournament that I do here in Mississippi is Saturday, uh, supporting the Special Ops Warrior Foundation. Uh, all the proceeds will go to the uh, – the children and I'm hoping to raise about 20 grand, but for a tournament in Mississippi, not now around a, a, a special ops hub uh, is pretty strong. Man, th thanks for doing that chief. That, uh, thanks for, I mean, not only for your, your service, but what you, what you've been able to do after as well. It, 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 part, part of me, I, uh, we, the Rangers, we were going to have a uh, hard rock, Charlie, same thing. We we're going to have a reunion got canceled. I think we've, uh, we've, we've booted it to, uh, you know, for, for one year, but, uh, just reconnecting with those guys, uh, was, was awesome because some of the guys got out after their first, uh, their first hitch. And, uh, so their memories are, are vivid. You know, a lot of guys, like you said, stayed in, uh, had great careers, but yeah, I, I, I've had this conversation with Randy. I, I think every time we assemble the, the, the package of whoop ass that, uh, that it honors these guys. All right. I can remember throughout my career, you know, we'd head to the airfield at dusk, and right about the time that most Americans are settling in, uh, you know, post dinner in an easy chair with a remote. And then I'd watch the load masters. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. And they'd crack open the airplanes, they'd drop the ramps and you got the glow of the red, you know, the green cabin lights. And you know, I'd, I'd watch it, it just in amazement of this organized mob of, of troops, you know, from all the services, they, they'd pack airframes, they'd pack, uh, you know, helicopters, assault trucks, aid vehicles, motorcycles, ramp pallets and then uh, the paratroopers would come you know they're going to clear the runway would uh, come marching up and then the load master would do his final 360 you know as the uh, as the engines are starting to crank he's got his uh you know with his uh his um ah was it fire extinguisher in his hand right yeah. and then he'd be the last man to board the board through the troop hatch and pull that lanyard in and then that whole armada of whoop ass would take flight and then uh, it, was just, it was it was a joy to be a part of that in the jrx's and they, I just remember thinking every time that that's a piece of terrain on anywhere on planet Earth that we care to seize for as long as we care to hold it. And uh, I, I think the legacy, that impressive legacy, you know, still kind of, uh, you know, gets gets me emotional. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I get to go over to Herbert and, and hang out and talk to the children every once in a while because they call me uh, the, the godfather over there. <laughs> but, you know. It's neat to look at them and see that uh, the tactics and techniques and procedures that we developed back in 1980, they're still using today because they can't make them any better. They are simplistic. They work 100% of the time as long as you follow them. The, the difference is, is they have Much better, of it. better technology uh, equipment-wise than we do. They've got better lighting, uh, better uh, uh, ramps, uh, better... Uh, radio equipment, stuff like that. But the actual basic human piece of how it works uh, from a manual labor, it still works exactly the same way. And, you know, I tell everybody, you know, the big red goes down when we go to work. True. Uh, I don't like being out there flying in the daylight because Ray Charles can shoot you in the daylight. This yeah. is true. It's not yeah. a good place to be. I, I, I got to ask you, uh, how did you get your nickname, Taco? That's an interesting one. When uh, I went in the military uh, out of Chicago, Illinois, uh, 
I was born in West Palm Beach, Florida. My mom and dad, well, my mom, my stepfather, moved to Chicago in 60. And so when I went into basic training in 71, August of 71, I go down to Lackland and there was 79 in my flight. 68 had Spanish surnames. I was the only one white skin who couldn't speak Spanish. So they called me a taco. And I'm like, a taco? This poor Taco Bell and any of that stuff. I says, a taco? What the heck is that? And they said, well, you got a white shell and you're brown on the inside. <laughs> so I've been called Taco since August the 29th of 1971. And everybody goes, uh, over my military career, everybody goes like, is that really a, an official nickname? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you can't have nicknames. You know, fighter pilots always had a name on their. Uh, oh, you're the, right. You're right. <laughs> And uh, they're like, you can't. And I said, well, you know, uh, I don't know. You have to ask the four star generals who signed my EPRs to say Taco can nail Jello to a wall. <laughs> and then I had medals that General Luck and General Downing signed that in the narrative says Taco Sanchez. So I'm thinking, you know, uh, I got a three, four stars that all call me Taco. I'm pretty sure it's a damn nickname that sticks. Outstanding. Well, th thanks for thanks for sharing sharing that. The uh, I, I think we're almost made our time hack, man. For a couple old uh, broken down senior NCOs, like we we did pretty good. Yeah, I, I think um, if we can get Randy or um, or Chelsea to come come back on, I I, I think we may have some questions from the audience. Yeah, we have one question. It's coming from Matt Caruso, who's on the Global Soft Board. Oh, I know Matt. One of my babies. <laughs> He, he said he did not know the taco origin story, so he was excited about that. Um, but he also asked, um, based on what you know about today's soft training and exercises, would you say we are living up to the lessons learned by you and the Desert One teams or no? I, I'd say that, that at the uh, nug level, absolutely. It just, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, as Matt knows, uh, leadership-wise, some people still get in leadership positions that sometimes we wonder who put them in charge. But at the pure NUG level, the airplane operator level, the, uh, the, the maintainers, the, the air crews and stuff, they're still rocking and socking. You know, I'm, I'm so proud of some of the stuff that they did in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, you know, yes, we've lost some. But when it's all said and done, they applied the stuff. They did good. And one thing I love about uh, – the soft guys, especially the Air Force guys, and not to be prejudicial, <laughs> but I'm not seeing no movies and uh, and 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 books written about tactics and techniques uh, all over uh, you know the world. Uh, they're still the quiet professionals, which uh, is the way we should always stay. Outstanding. Hey, well, well said, my brother. I think this um, this brings us to the conclusion uh, of topic three, Soft Stories Live, if we don't have any further questions. So again, Operation Eagle Claw, on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you for your service. And also, uh, thanks for candidly sharing your personal experience with, uh, with the viewers. And uh, it's been, yeah, I, I, I probably bumped into you years ago on some dark tarmac, but uh, I, I've always throughout my career heard of Taco Sanchez. Taco Sanchez, so it's, it's, it's been an honor to finally meet you for reals and uh, Randy, now, I really am a person yeah <laughs> that's right <laughs> the man the myth the legend so randy I'm, I'm gonna kick it back to you my brother i'm giving you some time back okay great uh uh chief sanchez i i really really appreciate uh the time and i want to extend a special thanks for that and uh csm uh lamb uh that that was an outstanding uh, presentation there. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank you, uh, extend a thank you to uh, Greenwich uh, Entertainment, History Films Cabin, and Cabin Creek Films for permission to use the film Desert One trailer at the beginning of our broadcast. We'd also like to extend a special thanks to the producers, David Cassidy, Eric Foreman, and Barbara Koppel for permission to use the film Desert One trailer at the beginning. The film uh, publicly reveals a rare insight into details of the operation not previously known, and the soft stories live as a story needed to be told. We encourage you to watch that film. The broadcast today was significant as it marks the 41st anniversary of the taking of hostages within the embassy in Tehran, Iran. As for the format of soft stories live, please bear in mind the experiences are often decades removed from an operation. So any historical inconsistencies are unintentional 
have not been specifically previewed or cleared for release from the Department of Defense, nor does it represent their views. We ensure all content involving a special operation has either been unclassified and or publicly released by the DOD prior to the broadcast. Therefore, it's important to emphasize the primary intent of Soft Stories Live is to present and disclose their stories as remembered exclusively by the special operator who experienced them. Most of all, thank you viewers for your participation in this live broadcast. Please be sure to join us in December as our next moderator and selected guests will explore their recollections of topic four, Operation Just Cause, the invasion of Panama. We look forward to having you join us again. Until then, on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation and Soft Stories Live, I'm the host, Chief Master Sergeant Retired Randy Anderson. Good afternoon and God bless America.